welcome to the show. It's me, John Park. It's time for another episode of John Park's Workshop. And I would like to, first of all, thank everyone for stopping by over in our Discord. If you're wondering where the chat is, you can head over to adafru.it slash Discord and go to the live broadcast chat channel. That is one place. Also, I'm keeping an eye over here on the YouTube. So hello, uh, Chris Stone, Gary T, Charles, Dave, welcome. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that does it. So let's get going. Uh, let's see. First things first, I will mention that we've got a jobs board over at jobs.adafruit.com and you can head on over there if you're looking for work. Uh, also if you're looking to hire someone. So that site that I'm hidden behind right there, let me squeeze that down a little bit smaller. Uh, that is jobs.adafruit.com and that's the, uh, open positions. What do we call that? Available uh, search jobs and available for hire is the other uh, other one. I don't think I'm logged in, so it's not going to let me go there. But if you're logged in, you can go and uh, look for people who are looking for work. So uh, always free and always vetted. So good stuff there. Check it out at jobsdayfruit.com. Also, uh, Tuesdays, I've got this show right here. And that is JP's product pick of the week. And I usually take about 15, 20 minutes, show you a new or not so new, but cool product uh, that we have a deep, deep discount on with no coupon code required. Just throw one or 10 of them in your cart, buy them during the show or a little grace period after, and you'll get a deep discount. This week it was 50% off on this beauty right here, which is the uh, dot star matrix. And I've got a little one minute recap of the show here. This is this week's product pick of the week. It is the Dot Star 8x8 64 pixel LED grid. It's a little one inch by one inch square. It's got 64, it's eight by eight of the little dot stars on there. And you can see there's these little mounting tabs. You can snap those off or you can use them with M2.5 screws to attach them to something. Uh, I'm running this under some diffusion acrylic, so it's going to look a little bit blobby. I'll turn my exposure down so you can see a little better there. Uh, so here I'm running some scrolling text across here, as well as just some flashing colors. And what I'll do is I'll show you how that's set up. There's a lot of ways that you can code these. You can use uh, in Arduino, Fast LED, in CircuitPython, Fancy LED, LED Animation Library. That is my product pick of the week. It is the 64 LED dot star grid, eight by eight. Hey, there's my audio working. Uh, and in fact, I like that one so much that I wanna show a little more specifically how you can code it. So that's gonna be the star of this week's circuit, Python Parsec, which we're gonna jump right into now. For the circuit Python Parsec today, I want to show you how you can use the Pixel Frame Buff library to write to a dot star or a NeoPixel matrix. So here I have a NeoPixel, or rather, here I have a dot star matrix, and in my code you can see I am importing both dot star and Adafruit Pixel Frame Buff. Now, Frame Buff allows you to treat a matrix or kind of any strip of NeoPixels or dot stars like it's a display, so it makes sense if it's in a grid. And here, what I do is I set up my dot star grid, and then I set up PyPixel, or rather, then I set up Pixel Frame Buff. I tell it to use my dot star uh, grid. I tell it it's eight by eight for the dimensions. And then we can set where the strip starts. I'm starting in the upper left, so I say reverse X. And alternating is gonna allow me to use a snake-like pattern as if it's not a snake-like pattern. You'll see here in a second what that means. Uh, then I'm setting up some color definitions. And here are the commands that I can use to display. So I'm just gonna uncomment and save. So this is pixel frame buff fill, and I give it a color. We have an individual pixel draw. So here I can say, pixel frame buff pixel and then a coordinate in x, y, so four by four, I'm telling that to draw. Next, I have a line, and this one's cool because you can, whoops, one second, there we go. Next, we have a line. So for this one, I do pixel frame buff line, and then I give it an x, y coordinate for the start and an x, y coordinate for the stop position, and it draws a, a line between those two vertices. Uh, then we can do some 
horizontal or vertical lines, and there you tell it a starting point and a distance that it continues on in. That also works for a vertical line, and we can have multiple of these up at a time. I've just been commenting them out for convenience, but there you can see horizontal and vertical. And then we can also do a rectangle as well as a filled rectangle. So commands there are rect or filled rect, and then we give it a upper left corner, lower right corner in XY space, and then the color to use. And there's more that you can do with it, but that's just a starter of some of the easy shapes that you can display on a NeoPixel or dot star matrix using Pixel Frame Buff. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. One thing I like to do actually is give you a little bit of a uh, bonus after the CircuitPython Parsec, the extended Parsec. Uh, and for that, I want to just show what some of this um, reverse and alternating stuff is all about. So let's say we do, uh, how about a vertical line? So I'm going to uncomment my vertical line here. And let's make this the full height. So I'll start at zero on Y and I'll go eight pixels. So here, if I save this, you'll see we've got a line that starts at the top and heads down to the bottom. Uh, now let's, in fact, start this at the upper left corner. So I'm going to put X to zero. Uh, now, if I change the reverse to false, you'll see that this physical first pixel is actually on the other side. So it's right to left, which may work for some uses, but I wanted it to start left to right. So I use that little flag reverse X. And then alternating, if we say true to this, it will treat every other line as if we are wrapping around in a snake-like pattern rather than straight up and down. And again, depending on how the physical layout and wiring of the dot stars or the NeoPixels are, you may need to uh, set this to the other uh, Boolean there in order to get expected results. Uh, one other thing I'll show you, a neat little bonus here, is with something like the line. Uh, I did a very nice, neat one by having this start uh, at 0, 0 and end at 7, 7. But if we move in just one pixel, you'll see, well, you can't really draw a straight line on a grid, so we're going to get some sort of uh, unexpected uh, sort of aliasing there. And as, as we move this around, you'll see uh, different fun results that give you funky wiggly things that are the spirit of the line, but it's, not, it's never going to be a straight line because we're dealing with fixed uh, grid points in space. Uh, I imagine if you wanted to get creative with it, you could add some anti-aliasing to that so that you end up with some dimmer pixels that uh, thicken it but, but make it look straight. But this is really cool, and I had honestly never seen or played around with this, but it's great. It's, uh, I think Melissa created this, and it's a way of treating a dot star or NeoPixel grid as if it's one of our RGB matrices, uh, some of the same commands, and sort of like our display I.O. stuff as well. So... Very cool. Yes, jaggy, Dexter, very jaggy. Um, Gary Z asks, where can I find the example code for the circuit Python, Python Parsec? Unfortunately, I don't usually publish these just in the interest of time, but they are so uh, generally so short and sweet that they can be copied just from uh, looking at a couple frames of the video. Usually I've got the, um, the full code up here most of the time. So uh, Sorry about that. Not, not an easy copy paste, but it should be, shouldn't be too bad. Uh, sometimes they are, this is not, not one of these cases, uh, sometimes they are taken from the uh, Learn Guide or Toddbot's GitHub page for the Toddbot tips and tricks, and in those cases you can, you can copy and paste uh, nearly the same. Sometimes I'll make small changes, but nearly the same code. All right, uh, so let's see. Next up, whoops, <laughs> just we're coming up next. Next up, uh, I wanted to do a little bit of a gear report. I don't always do these, but I got a cool, a cool kit in the mail that I had ordered from someone on Tindy. 
Uh, I wanted to show you the web page for it and then uh, dig into the, the goodie bag of the kit uh, that, we, uh, that we got or that I got. So let me jump over to Chrome here. Where'd you go, Chrome? And let me, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll be wise and find it before I try to open the page because sometimes the search process uh, leads you weird places. Let's see, I'm gonna go to Here we go, I have found it. All right. Uh, so this is, I'll say this is, there's one left. So if someone gets excited about this, jump on it, because uh, there's just one. I'm sure the, the maker is gonna make more of them. Uh, but this is the Enigma lamp board kit. And the goal is to make that. So it doesn't come with a wood case. So that's part of the fun is building your enclosure or repurposing an enclosure. Uh, but what it is, is it looks like the uh, upper half of a World War II German encryption machine called the Enigma machine. And with it, you would, after setting your uh, crypto key settings, it had a typewriter at the base of it. And when you would type in a letter, it would light up the encrypted version of that letter. And then you would send it, write it down, uh, Morse code it, however you were gonna get it out to someone else. So this upper half is uh, a series of lamps underneath this um, circuit board here. So I wanted to show you how Gorgeous. I can't wait to build the kit. I haven't yet, but I wanted to show you uh, this gorgeous kit here. And this is from Hack Modular on Tindy. Hack Modular is in London, building a bunch of cool stuff. I think you can also buy a pre-made one. Uh, there's a few of those in stock, but uh, just one left of these. So I put it in my own cigar box because I may build it into this, into this box before building one. Uh, but check it out. So here is uh, the circuit board for the top of it. You can see on the back there it says Enigma and it has some Morse code here. Uh, these are PCB uh, fiber F FR4 material that has um, some silk screen holdouts for the letters. So if you shine a light through there, I don't have my flashlight but I can use my phone one. Uh, the effect of this is going to be that you can light up these letters. Um, hold on one second. And actually, if you'll hold one second, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to show the video from this so you can see the effect uh, that we're going for. So this is a voltage character display based on the illuminated lamp board of an Enigma cipher machine, famously broken at Bletchley Park with help from the Turing Welchman bomb. It's a bit of an unusual Eurac module because it doesn't make any sound of its own. It's purely a visual display. It's part of a series of modules exploring early computers and telecommunications, like this paper tape reader, relay switch, and Vernon Cypher machine. It's very simple. It's got one voltage control input and a buffered through output. So you can just continue your patch through the module to another one. The voltage control is scaled to one volt per octave. But in this case, one volt equals 12 characters with each character being assigned to a semitone. So if you play chromatically up the keyboard, it will select each character in sequence. Those characters are encoded in an either an alphabetical order or in the international teletype alphabet. That will get a lot more interesting once we're reading voltages off of paper tape. That's selected on the back of the module with choice of two sets of D multiplexer IC sockets. Of course, the real Enigma machine didn't send or receive Okay, uh, so I'm gonna run back over there. You get the idea with that, and sorry, I, I'm not so sure how clean the audio was coming through on that. Uh, so let me jump over here and uh, take a look at the goodies that come in this. So, like I said, we've got the top panel with the uh, knockouts for the lighting. 
we get all of the uh, very nicely bagged up components. There are some terrific little goodies in here, including, I don't know what this one came from, it says to call exchange, lift telephone and listen, replace telephone only when finished. So this looks like it goes into the dial, that little circle on the dial of a phone for like a lobby somewhere. Uh, there is a IBM 80 column uh, punch card in here, blank, unused. Got the little Enigma badges that go on here. And these are, uh, I'm not sure what, how these were printed. Looks like maybe a toner transfer onto aluminum, uh, but they look pretty nice. Uh, there's a silver one and a white kind of ivory one. You can attach those to the final build. Uh, there is the circuit board with silk on it for everything that's going on there. Uh, some other little extra goodies like a slide, a small screwdriver, probably for tuning uh, the uh, oscillator on that. A glider kit, uh, pack modular sticker, a cool little uh, collector's card. These came in cigarettes and tea. Uh, I guess this was a tea one. Uh, Inventors and Inventions Series of 50. I don't know when these were made, uh, but pretty cool little collector's card. Uh, that was the bag it came in, and here's the uh, ribbon cable for uh, power on that for connecting to modular. So I will be putting this together, and once I get it together, hopefully we can do some interesting stuff with it, uh, because you can use it anywhere from just a straight up voltage meter to see, I'm guessing, like negative 8 to positive 8 volts or something like that. Uh, but you can get, with higher frequency stuff, you can sort of print out messages to the display, which is pretty cool. Uh, so that is my little gear report. And I'm not uh, paid for this or anything like that. So if, if you get the one remaining kit, awesome. I don't see any, any uh, money from that. I just thought it was super cool and wanted to share that. And hopefully I'll encourage uh, Hack Modular to make more of them. So that's my gear report. All right. Uh, so, let me pop that back out there. Let's see what else is going on. Um, the, oh, the next thing. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about. First, I want to do a bit of a demo and then uh, on, on software and then get into the hardware software implementation of this. So, you know I've been going through this journey starting with the uh, cassette player mel uh, walk Mellotron with using control voltage and MIDI to adjust the speed on the cassette to uh, going back to the, the wave files in the audio mixer in circuit Python and Todd bots breakbeat uh, little button board. Now uh, I've been working on a more of a droning tape loop project and I showed a little demo of that last week. Um, and one of the things I realized when I was playing back demos of some wave files I had made of these tritone sine waves is that certain combinations that I was playing were giving me really nice sort of phasing, beating sine wave sounds that I really like. And so I wanted to explore that more. And I think it makes for a really interesting drone box, this drone box idea that I'm making. And what I want to do first is just show you uh, an example of how some of this phase cancellation and um, phase amplitude addition in additive synthesis works. Uh, and then I'll show you these examples where I can play two tones against each other and you can hear how these sound. And then we'll get to being able to play up to eight of them and what that does for creating these sort of beating frequencies. So, um, let me jump over here. I'm going to turn on a little speaker right here, and hopefully you'll be able to hear this uh, well enough. One second. So what I have here just to demonstrate this is VCV Rack, and this is free, uh, free and open source VCV Rack virtual modular software. You've seen me use this before. And what I have going on right now is I have two sort of identical setups that are allowing me to play sine waves, a pair of them, at the same time. And currently, they're in sync with each other. 
and they're the same frequency as each other. So even though there's two of them in this oscilloscope on the left where it looks blue, that's actually two overlapping sine waves that are identical. Um, so I'm going to turn up the sound on this monitor. Okay, and that's what that sounds like, uh, two sine waves identical to each other. Uh, now what I've done is, this will look a little uh, confusing, I've got this keyboard, it's not actually sending full semitones, I'm attenuating it, so I'm just barely bumping up the frequency on this second sine wave. So if we look at it here, uh, suddenly you'll see the scopes come to life. And first of all, if you look at this scope right here, you'll notice that I have my original blue signal and then I have this new purple one, that's the second one, those were in phase together. Now that one of them is a slightly different frequency, they keep going in and out of phase. They have the same amplitude as each other, but they, they keep going in and out of phase with each other. Uh, the combination of those two waves, when they're added together and, and we hear them, is this sort of pulsing of the amplitude, which is the volume. So you're going you're gonna to hear the sort of the volume uh, phasing up and down or in and out as those two sine waves beat against each other. Um, so here's what this sounds like if I turn my monitor back on. Where'd you go? There we are. All right, so that's the two waves identical, and here's one just being slightly higher frequency. Now this effect is uh, sometimes called heterodyne, and uh, it, it's used in signal communications. What it is on a perceptual level is we have two frequencies. If I play just one of them, and now I'll play just the second one. Okay, you can barely tell the difference between the two. If I play them both at the same time though, we add this frequency of essentially um, the phase cancellation in addition that is much, much slower than, than the frequency of those sine waves. So that beating up and down is this sort, almost sort of third frequency that, have, that emerges um, from this. And what you'll hear if I increase the frequency of that second uh, sine wave is that pulsing is going to increase its speed as well. Okay, so that's the sort of basic uh, explanation of what's going on here. It's this phase cancellation and phase addition uh, that gives us a, a beating sound. Uh, and it will vary depending on what I'll call like the base frequency and the, the second frequency. It's, it's kind of a modulation frequency, but not really. They're, uh, they're, they're both, they both have equal importance. It's just we get this third thing, this third beating sound that emerges when we play them. Um, so in my example here, just to keep it simple, and I didn't want to copy and paste a whole bunch of stuff, I just have two of them. But uh, with the project that I've been building, I now have, let's go to the bench, I now have the ability to play eight of them. So I'll just pop that guy there for a second and talk about that. Um, so what I've done is I've taken my Feather M4 that I was using and I have a little I2S audio amplifier, so it takes that digital uh, audio signal off of the feather and amplifies it so I can put it through a speaker. I have a little speaker in there, I think it's an 8 ohm 1 watt speaker in there. Uh, and then I have these eight toggle switches and um, I'm eventually going to be changing those out for these 808 style lighted stepped uh, buttons, but right now I've got toggle switches for it. And then I have a little display on there, and uh, I've also got an, a rotary encoder so that I can pick from different banks of wave files. So, not to get too convoluted with this, but what I was doing was just recording wave files that loop perfectly. So they they uh, start and end through the zero line because these are these are alternating uh, positive and negative. So I made little snippets of those different sine waves that I just played for you one at a time. So now I can use the audio IO 
mixer in CircuitPython to play all of them at the same time. Uh, they start together, they run in sync together, and then I can just adjust the gain. So I'm essentially mixing them in. Now you can do this with sliders, which would be very cool. Uh, but for this one, I just have, have switches. Um, I have banks of or sets of eight wave files that I can sort of swap between. It happens really fast. So these could be, you know, eight drum beats or eight songs or someone saying the alphabet up to whatever the eighth letter is, H or something. Um, but the, uh, it doesn't really matter what they are, but what I've got here are some different uh, semitones in sine, triangle, sawtooth, and, uh, or square wave, and this sort of even harmonics one. And then uh, the fifth one is not semitones, it's this idea, which I find much more compelling actually, uh, of having just slight increases in frequency that, so that we can get these uh, beat frequency oscillations, as Dave Odessa called them over on YouTube. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so let's, uh, let's take a listen to that. Uh, DJ Devin says, eight, wouldn't 16 be better? Well, probably, uh, but eight, eight works pretty well for this and kept my hardware to a reasonable size. Um, so let me jump over there and give you a little demo of that. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear it well. I might move my mic onto the speaker. I don't have a line out on this. I just have a little speaker uh, on there. So let me, let me jump over and give a little demo here. Uh, let's see, first of all, I need a power supply. Did I actually forget to get a... This one will work. Let me grab a battery. Okay. Uh, Let's plug this in, and I'll show you the guts here. I'll take it apart a little bit and show you the guts after we do a little demo. I guess an onboard battery would be a good idea with this. Uh, so the screen doesn't flicker in real life, but just based on my camera settings here, you're going to get a bit of a flicker. And I'll zoom in here. That's pretty good. Uh, and I will take my mic and set it down here for a moment. Let's clip it to something nearby. and then I can use my little knob here and go to triangles. We can go to, I think, square. Definitely square. Here's the even harmonics. some phasing there because that has more harmonics uh, in it than something like just the sign. Uh, there's more uh, uh, interplay there than some of those purer tones. And now my last one here, uh, the fifth bank, is these uh, sort of microtonal uh, frequencies that we can use to do this cool heterodyne thing. So here we go. Here's... Try to look at the chat real quick. Let me know if that's if that's audible. Um, 
Otherwise, this is not a lot of fun at all. Let me uh, open up my Discord. Let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, so let me know. Total level. Thank you. Okay. So this is where it gets cool. This is, this is the part I didn't do over on the computer. And this is going to be... Uh, more than two of these sine waves that are out of phase with each other uh, interacting. So you'll get these polyrhythms that start to emerge. For some reason, that was way louder before. I think I lowered uh, their pitch in, t in code. But that's a good excuse to uh, to go in there. Sorry, I'll put my mic back here. That's going to be a good excuse to show you the code because I'm going to increase the, the level of the gain. I've got, um, I have intentions of adjusting gain with this knob as well. But right now, I, I, I don't have multiple modes for this. But since this is a push encoder, we should be able to do multiple modes. Um, so let's... Uh, let me turn this off. I've got a little enable switch there. And then I will show you what's what in here. Let me zoom out just a little bit. And I think I have just two screws. So this is just very tenuously put together uh, at the moment. But I have just two screws at the base here. And then I have one long header pin holding the screen display and I thought I was going to use a ribbon cable for it but it was short enough to just stack some headers all right so we can see inside of it um, okay so main board here is my Feather M4. I've got a little enable switch here. And I, sh I posted this on uh, Instagram and Twitter last night. I added a little, there's this cool SparkFun breakout board, the quick breakout that gives us two of these quick slash stem QT ports running to I squared C, uh, power, ground, uh, clock, and, and data. I just did some very tiny little wiring job in there so that you can um, connect nice easy stem QT cables to your stuff. So if I unplug that one there, uh, that's how my rotary encoder and my buttons are connected. I'll show you in a second a little more about those. Then I have a little breakout here for my display. So all the pins of this OLED display right here, I just added, I stacked an extra long stacky header on there. Uh, so that I can sandwich that down in when I close it and it connects uh, so I was able to separate those. Uh, that's where I thought maybe a ribbon cable would be useful. Uh, then I've got my little I2S amplifier. So that runs to the pins on the board and I'm using the 5 volt uh, USB power instead of the 3 volt uh, onboard power just because I need to draw more current for the speaker and I was browning it out before. Uh, the speaker here, okay, it's the 4 ohm it's supposed to be the Forum 3 watt. That could be my problem. Uh, and I, I talked about this on Show and Tell last night. I was very excited to be able to reuse this swatch of uh, Aeron chair mesh from a really old chair. I had to replace the, the mesh on it. 
and uh, I saved the old one that was torn up and I used that as my little speaker, my fabric speaker there, <laughs> cover there. Uh, and in fact, this you can unscrew. So these come apart entirely, so I'll go ahead and do that. This has a little uh, terminal block on the amp so that I can take the two pieces apart. Sorry, I didn't do that on camera, but this was me unscrewing that. Uh, and so here is the main uh, interface of the board, interface display speaker. The switches and LEDs may look familiar to you because I built this thing and just had it on its own little board using a cutie pie. That cutie pie is not being used in this at all. It just happens to be there. And I had uh, used a Stemma QT cable on this little I.O. board. This is a I squared C MCP 23017, which is out of stock now and that chip is gone. So we gotta find a replacement for it. But th that really cool board allows me to have eight of these inputs and eight PWMs for these lights, for these LEDs. Uh, and so this was really expedient for me to just redesign the, the face and, and uh, laser cut that and add these switches. But ultimately I'll be doing some, some uh, buttons for that. Uh, and then this is our Stemma QT rotary encoder breakout. Uh, it's a seesaw board. This is a seesaw board as well. And that's about it. So let me reassemble this. I was very proud of, of this mostly modular design so that I could assemble it and disassemble it. Um, all of this I did on a breadboard first and in fritzing so I could hopefully get it right before I started soldering. And I mostly did. I didn't have too many uh, mistakes to fix as I put that together yesterday. I did not put any of those little crimp ferrules on these wires and I wish I did because I'm always paranoid about stray wires touching the neighboring terminal, but if you solder tin them, they don't really clamp down very well with the screw terminal. So I should use those little crimp ferrules. Okay, so that's the speaker connected. There's the Stemma cable for I squared C. And then I've got to get my display lined up. And these little spindly stacking header pins are a pain. Okay, there we go. Oop. I think I got it. Like I said, a bit of a flimsy prototype construction, but I'm going to be uh, revising this and I'll probably make a 3D printable or combo 3D printable and enclosure or something case so that it's easier for people to put together if they don't have a CNC or laser cutter, which is admittedly not as common as 3D printers. Okay, that looks plausibly together. I'm just gonna test it here real quick and then we'll go plug it in and take a look at the, uh, some of the code stuff that's happening right now. And we'll boost the volume. So I'll flip my enable switch and you can see it lighting up. Uh, that is one thing I like about this LED plastic is that you can see indicator LEDs even if you don't design light pipes and things for them, you can at least see some blinking. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and shut this off, plug it into the computer, and make it louder, first of all. All right, let me get a little down view of this. Here. Adjust my exposure a bit. Uh, let's fix the focus. It's 
pretty close. And let's do actually this view here. Okay. So let's see. I'm hopeful that the hub I'm plugging into can provide the current necessary to drive all of this. Oh, it looks like it just failed. Yeah, that could be a current thing. I may have to... I thought I had it running off of here yesterday, though. There it is. Okay. So I'm going to open up the code that's on there. So it's all circuit Python. Uh, one thing I was thinking about with this is the sort of hardware platform here could be really cool for using the Teensy audio library as well to do like synthesis on board because obviously right here uh, to keep keep it lighter weight uh, and running fast in circuit Python I'm just using the audio mixer and wave files which is easier than generating things on the fly I suspect um, although there, there could be some ways with lookup tables uh, to make that work uh, so here we go uh, in code, I won't go through all of this, but some key features. I've got this MCP 23017 uh, I2C board, and that's where my toggle switches and my LEDs uh, are all connected. So that is something I can just read all at once and write to all at once over Seesaw. Same with the rotary encoder. So we set up a Seesaw device for rotary encoder there. Uh, I was thinking about using the arcade uh, button thing, a couple of those for eight buttons, which may be necessary if, if we don't have a replacement uh, chip, but I think we do have a replacement chip coming out for that I.O. board. Then uh, here are my banks of WAV files. So it's probably a more elegant way to do this, but all I have are folders on the CircuitPy drive that are uh, named signs, triangles, squares, evens, and detunes, which are the little uh, beating frequency ones. And then I have a series of uh, wave files in there. So I'm opening all of those up. Uh, when I change my rotary encoder, I, I swap out which, which set I'm playing. Um, so for out of curiosity, what happens if I bump this way up in volume? Still not that loud. All right, well, let's... Whoops. Yeah, that's better. All right, let me move the mic down here for a second. You can hear that. so much louder in my inside lab, but uh, that's the nature of things. I've got, got loud air conditioning going on here. So then I make a, a little set of these sets, which I can ask for when I change uh, the rotary encoder to pick a different set. And that's done with this little start waves uh, function here. And it, it just runs through each of the wave files in that little list. Uh, opens them with the raw binary method and assigns them to a voice. So we get eight voices there. Uh, and then adjusting the gain of those voices from what's in this list, which is 0.9 in this case, to zero is all that the toggle switches are doing. A uh, bunch of OLED setup stuff for my OLED display there. This is actually the four level or 16 
16 level grayscale uh, display. I'm just using only white or black on here at the moment, but that one allows you to do grayscale. One thing I've noticed is that the once you get gray involved on this, it really flickers on camera. It's fine in, in real life, but the, the grays really seem to flicker for some reason. Uh, here's some stuff I'm not doing with the display that's just commented out. Uh, right now, this is just one frame of my sprite sheet animation. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing there, if I'm going to make a, try to make a little rotating tape reel. Uh, then I've got my text label, which says Drone 4 in this case. And that just changes that text update. Uh, and then this is the main loop. So again, you can see there's a section I'm not using. But in the main loop here, we look at all of the toggle switches uh, from our uh, coming off of the seesaw board there. And if they uh, have changed their values and they're uh, set to true, then we're setting the volume to the volume in the, in the gain list. And if they're off, then we set it to, uh, to zero. Uh, I'm also toggling the LEDs on and off when I do that. Uh, and then here's all that's going on with the encoder. We check the position. Uh, we see if it's different than the last position, which is a state variable we save. Uh, I am setting it, sort of clamping it to arrange uh, with this modulo function here uh, so that we just keep getting 0 through 4, 0 through 4, 0 through 4. Uh, and then here's where I call my start waves function, which says, OK, we've just moved to list 2. And it swaps out the, the waves there. Uh, I'm presuming that it doesn't need me to flush anything. I didn't look at the um, audio mixer code uh, documentation. I'm assuming that this sort of flushes it. I haven't had any problems where it like runs out of memory just because I keep switching. So I don't think it's adding on, uh, which I don't think they're all playing. I think just the latest set is playing. Uh, or, or I could be totally wrong, but it seems to hold up so far. Uh, I will look into that. And then just for debugging's sake, I have, uh, if we do a screen, uh, which one is it? Oh, yeah, it's this one. OK. There you can see my position change on the um, encoder is all I'm all I'm recording here, and it works forward and, and back, or is all I'm printing here. Uh, and then that changes text area.txt to be the word drone plus string of set number. By the way, this is when I had comma in here, and comma doesn't work in there. You get like a tuple error. Uh, I was being boneheaded about it. Thank you, Todd Kurt, for saying, I think you want a plus in there, not a comma. So now it works, uh, but I'm, I'm forever making that mistake. So that, uh, that is it. Ooh, cool, cool, uh, cool tape animation there from Yanisku. I dig that. Uh, all right. Let me see if there's any questions I've missed over in the chats. Uh, thanks, Anthony Becerra and Dave Odessa. Uh, I appreciate it. Let's see. Getting Philip Glass vibes for sure. Hikari in a hurry, send gates for when composed waveform crosses a threshold. That could be interesting for sure. Uh, Axwax loves the polyrhythms. Way cool. Very satisfying. OK, good. Uh, thanks for, for playing along with that. It's been fun uh, developing this. I, I'm going to pause on this while we get some parts in. So one will be the, the I.O. board switcheroo, and the other will be this, these cool little step switches that have LEDs built into the into the tactile switch cap at the top. Uh, and then I have, a, I have one switch to make in my code that I had been using before so that instead of a real toggle, I'll use a momentary switch like a toggle and it'll just change the LED color depending on which state it's in. We'll hear it or, or we won't hear it. Uh, and I think that's going to do it. OK, thanks, Jim Hendrickson. Thanks, everyone, for stopping by. It's going to wrap up. I will see you next Tuesday for another product pick of the week. Uh, and next Thursday for workshop. So for Ada Fruit Industries, I'm John Park, and this has been John Park's workshop. Bye, everyone. <laughs>